Welcome to Mr. Rodman's Top 12 Highlights from Chapter 12 for AP Gov. This chapter is on the presidency, and we're going to take you through the Top 12 Highlights. Let's start with number one, the executive branch. That's what this chapter is all about, the President of the United States and those who work with the President. Uh, the formal qualifications we talked about in class, you must be 35 years of age, a natural born citizen, though we don't always know what this means, and a resident of the United States for 14 years. The 12th Amendment split the votes for President and Vice President uh, in the Electoral College so that uh, because of the election of 1800 to ensure that uh, the electors knew who uh, was being who was being elected to the position of president as well as vice president. The 22nd Amendment limited the president to serving two full four-year terms, uh, and that is uh, as long as they have not served more than two years of another president's term, so up to 10 years in office. And then the 25th Amendment, uh, created during the Cold War, actually called for a line of presidential succession. This was uh, to prevent uh, any type of succession um, from a natural disaster that uh, killed several people uh, that were in line for the presidency, such as the Speaker of the House, President Pro Temporary, uh, the Senate President Pro Temporary, uh, as well as the Vice President and others. So this really created a line of succession for the president uh, so that um, there was a, a plan of attack in the event of a major national crisis. In addition, uh, it also outlines how the president can be removed temporarily from office um, if they um, are incapacitated, they're go undergoing anesthesia for surgery. President Bush uh, had this happen, President George W. Bush, and Dick Cheney, the vice president, uh, stepped in under the 25th Amendment. This has happened uh, several times under the 25th Amendment, and, um, and then the president uh, gets the power back. Obviously, they're of the same party, so it is in their interest uh, to, to have that um, continuity uh, after after the president comes out of surgery. So uh, that's kind of the highlights uh, from the uh, the presidency point of view and some of the amendments to the Constitution impacting the office. Uh, we then move to the articles of impeachment. Remember, impeachment happens in the House. The trial happens in the Senate. To impeach a president means to bring them up on charges, but uh, the removal uh, from office is actually conducted in the Senate. We've never had a president removed from office. We have had two of them impeached by the House of Representatives, uh, both Andrew Johnson and William Jefferson Clinton. Uh, however, neither of them was ever convicted in the Senate. Uh, a, a common misnomer is that R President Richard Nixon, uh, many people say he was impeached and, and he wasn't. He was never impeached. He actually resigned before uh, the House of Representatives voted on his, imp his impeachment proceedings. Uh, the most uh, frequent the targets that we've seen of the impeachment and removal process has been judges, federal judges sitting on benches uh, being charged with corruption or bribery. That tends to be the most common uh, method of impeachment and removal. We talked a lot in class about the formal roles of the president. I just want to outline uh, the three formal roles, commander-in-chief, chief diplomat, and chief executive. Again, these are overseeing the armed forces, working within um, the context of uh, foreign policy issues and dealing with other nations one-on-one -on -one or directly. Uh, this is where the, the real deals get done. It's not in the head of state role, but really as chief diplomat. And then chief executive, overseeing the four million plus people that work within the executive branch and the bureaucracy uh, in Washington, around across the country, and all around the world. Signing statements are what presidents use to either sign a bill into law or to veto it and to tell you why. It usually attracts media attention because of the significance and um, whether or not uh, they're going to choose to support or ignore what's in the law. And that usually tends to make a difference there. Uh, there is a piece here from President Bush in, in signing uh, the No Child Left Behind Act of 2001, you may uh, be familiar with. And um, he talks a little bit more in his signing statement. He actually went to Ohio to deliver that. And and that's not uncommon that a president would uh, go out of their way to sign it in a particular place uh, that is significant. In this case, he went to a public school in Ohio to do so. Uh, the War Powers Act of 1973, again, trying to tie the hands of the commander in chief uh, by limiting to 60 days uh, the amount of time that a president can send troops uh, into harm's way or into humanitarian efforts. Uh, he 
he or she, uh, the president, needs to inform Congress and then um, and ask for additional time, additional resources. Again, Congress holding the power of the purse. Uh, but usually the president, when sending troops into harm's way, is going out of uh, their way in order to make sure Congress is informed. And the reason for that is, is from a uh, rally around the flag point of view, just to keep everyone on the same page to make sure that everyone's in lockstep when it comes to dealing with other nations. Um, executive agreements are a way that the president can deal with other nations without uh, needing Senate approval. This is, uh, this is similar to an executive order that would be done on domestic issues, but the issue here is uh, it's in working with another country. Uh, in many cases, this may uh, be uh, some type of a smaller agreement that doesn't rise to the level of a treaty status, uh, and it could be a situation that's dealing with trade, uh, maybe pr trying to promote a couple of American businesses in foreign countries, trying to get them uh, to support trade and buy and selling of American goods. Uh, so the executive agreement does not need um, presidential, or excuse me, U.S. Senate approval, uh, but it also doesn't extend uh, past the president's time in office. So there is a limited shelf time uh, to the executive agreement's life. The president uses the bully pulpit quite a bit uh, to set the agenda, and we see this use of the media a lot. The president will talk to the media, and, and whatever he says that day essentially becomes news. This is the power of the presidency in having this soapbox to speak uh, to the American people and, and to speak to Congress uh, and really set the agenda. The president's one person, Congress 535 of them. Who wants to listen to 535 people? They'd rather listen to one, and thus the president has uh, the bully pulpit to do so. And so so uh, a lot of times they'll use uh, they'll use a trial balloon, uh, maybe threatening sanctions on Iran in the media to try and get them back to the table uh, in diplomatic uh, meetings and discussions. Uh, and that's a really great way uh, for him to reach out to Congress. He's going to threaten to veto some legislation. So please make sure you send me a better bill. Um, he's talking to the media, he's talking to the American people, but he's really talking to Congress and telling them what he wants or doesn't want in a particular bill. We also see executive privilege used by the president, um, especially when uh, the president is trying to have meetings with advisors uh, that work very closely with the president and in the executive office or in the West Wing. Um, this has been a back and forth between Congress and the president. How much information um, will the president allow advisors to give to Congress? Will he allow them to speak and testify before Congress? How close are they to the president in terms of who can or cannot testify? And this is an ongoing gray area in terms of balance um, with, uh, with those testifying before Congress and those in which the president does claim executive privilege. Empowerment of funds is really when the Congress budgets for something and the president doesn't want to spend the money on it. So, so <clears throat> under the Budget Reform Act of 1974, the president does have um, the power to uh, withhold funds and uh, tell Congress, as long as he tells Con Congress that he's not going to spend the money, he can do so. One would think that Congress uh, wouldn't like that in terms of the president being able to pick and choose what they're deciding to spend. Kind of sounds like a line item veto type of thing that was ruled unconstitutional by the courts, but it's actually this has actually been upheld by the federal courts. Um, as long as the president's giving notice and notifying Congress under the Budget Reform Act of 1974, within those 45 days uh, that, that the president's uh, going to uh, not spend the money, uh, Congress has, excuse me, the 45 days in order to, to uh, get rid of that spending. And and again, uh, that has been upheld by the courts that the president has the power to do so. Um, number 10 is, is rather large, looking at the, how does the president actually enforce the laws and really execute all of this. Uh, he has an enormous staff when you're uh, talking about three particular areas. We've got the executive office of the president, the White House staff, and the cabinet. And we'll look at these in a little more detail here. Uh, the executive office of the president includes OMB, probably the most important to the president. Uh, those are the folks that are working on budgetary matters, financial matters, making sure that uh, agencies are spending uh, appropriately what they uh, set out to do. Uh, the Government Accountability Office will uh, will take a closer look at that. But OMB does this on behalf of the president. They work they work directly for the president. Uh, the CIA uh, looking at intelligence matters around the world and, and foreign policy and how it impacts Americans around the world. The Council of Economic Advisors also reporting to the president here from the executive office uh, in terms of economic issues. How can we create more hashtag jobs, jobs, jobs? Uh, the Office of Personnel Management 
management, looking at uh, what does the, the hiring uh, situation look like with the federal government? Uh, do we Are we getting the type of talent and the, the career-driven uh, executives within the agencies and the departments that we need? And then the Office of the Trade Representative uh, is really about promoting trade with other countries and working with that, that uh, the president in that role of chief diplomat uh, to reach out to other countries with either executive ag agreements or treaties or other methods to promote trade and obviously promote American business. The White House staff are the uh, people who typically work as uh, either senior advisors to the president. They're uh, the chief aides. They're the staff that work with the, the president in the West, West Wing. And it's important to note here uh, that these people aren't uh, confirmed by the Senate, but they are very close to the president. There's a reason why they've been given these roles. Uh, you can see in the map of the, the West Wing who's there uh, and particularly who's not. And uh, the, the importance of proximity equaling power here it really cannot be understated because these are the people that the president sees on a daily basis, uh, goes to and asks more questions of, and really uh, gets tries to get advice from them and, and um, insight on decisions that he's making. You can see some of the uh, advisors that are listed here. The cabinet uh, is probably the most common in terms of uh, those that you know, 14 cabinet secretaries, an attorney general working for the Department of Justice, and all of the different departments that run uh, the bureaucracy, which we'll talk about more in the, in the chapter on the bureaucracy. Uh, his inner cabinet are really those that are closestly, uh, most closely working with him. That would be uh, the Secretary of the Treasury, the Attorney General, the Secretary of Defense, and Secretary of State. Those four uh, roles tend to work with the president uh, most closely because of the serious matters uh, in terms of sending troops into harm's way, dealing with the budget, uh, dealing with uh, state uh, matters in, in, in dealing with other nations, and obviously dealing with um, laws and the enforcement of those laws through the Attorney General. Uh, so these advisors uh, aren't in the Constitution, but uh, confirmation of the Senate, uh, by the Senate, excuse me, is, um, is required of any cabinet position. Uh, so if you serve as a secretary, uh, you would be called before the Senate for confirmation confirmation hearings, uh, much like a Supreme Court justice would. And uh, the president, uh, you serve at the pleasure of the president, so they can uh, demand your resignation at will and, and ask uh, for you t for today to be your last day. Uh, that is the role and, and the, uh, the trade-off of, of serving at the president's pleasure, uh, but also serving so closely to the president in one of these roles. And this kind of outlines uh, all of those pieces in looking at the different agencies, the corporations, uh, the government corporations, and the departments, uh, and you can look at that in more detail. Uh, number 11, the presidential appointments. Again, we talked about the cabinet departments here. Again, they serve at the pleasure of the president, so they can be removed at any time the president can call for their resignation. Independent agencies like NASA or the archives, uh, they are serving fixed terms. They can only be removed for cause. Uh, this is similar to the regulatory agencies like the federal Federal Reserve or the Federal Communications Commission, the FCC, uh, these they're kind of serving in their own kind of um, roles, and so as a result of that, uh, they can be they can only be removed for cause uh, because uh, they're given a little more independence in, uh, from the executive branch in terms of the role that they do play. Now, for government corporations, it is a little different. They do serve at the pleasure of the president. They can be removed, uh, and these would include things like the Postal Service or Amtrak. Uh, most of the time, we're going to see appointments either to the cabinet-level positions, to some of these agencies, as well as federal judges, uh, and those would need confirmation by the Senate, as, as do the cabinet-level positions. And this gives you a little more detail. We'll talk about this chart uh, here in the uh, 15th slide uh, in more detail when we get to the bureaucracy, but you can see the differences in, in the types of agencies we're looking at here. Uh, the cabinet level positions on, on the first row, the, in, the independent agencies, the independent executive agencies, uh, which really are, are kind of serving in their function within the executive branch. Uh, many linkages, but again, uh, serving, um, serving uh, in particular agencies with particular areas of focus or expertise. Independent regulatory agencies on the third row there, uh, they're regulating something, they're enforcing the laws uh, of the executive branch. And then government corporations, again, there's some level of enforcement, but also some level of um, service that is being provided via the executive branch, uh, via the government to uh, the American citizens, such as the Postal Service or the Tennessee Valley Authority through the electricity uh, for all provided to the Tennessee Valley. Uh, or Amtrak providing uh, service uh, across the country uh, through through rail and, and other passenger transport. 
Uh, lastly, the top 12 here, uh, let's differentiate between acting appointments and recess appointments. Uh, the acting appointments are those that are appointed on an acting basis, uh, thus the name. Um, Many times uh, there isn't a time limit here, or if there is one, it, it's really uh, not paid much attention to. Um, the idea here is with an acting appointment, uh, you're basically serving out a term, and we see a lot of this at the end of a president's administration. Uh, for example, at the end of the uh, President Obama's administration, uh, the Secretary of Education, Arne Duncan, steps down. Uh, he appoints an acting uh, secretary uh, who's basically uh, there to make decisions on behalf of the education department, but he's not going to go through a long and lengthy confirmation fight with the Senate all over again uh, for someone who may serve, you know, less than six, eight, ten months at most. Uh, so that's where the acting appointment really comes in. A recess appointment is a little different. Uh, that's where the president is bypassing the Senate in order to get someone into a position, and many times it's because the person that uh, the president is appointing is controversial, uh, and that controversy. Uh, the president wants to avoid uh, by avoiding a confirmation fight with the Senate. Uh, so uh, the president waits for a congressional recess and then uh, makes that appointment. These tend to be much more controversial today than they used to be. Uh, many times the Congress will start to play games with recesses and have people, uh, members of, of that particular chamber, stay in Congress in order to keep the Congress open so the president can't make those recess appointments. And this is more common when we have re uh, divided government where the, the executive branches of one party and the legislative branches of another. Uh, the last piece I want to mention in Chapter 12 is really a bonus, and this is about presidential approval. Um, the, the White House and the executive branch really want to keep presidential approval high, but what we have found is uh, this starts out well, uh, definitely sinks uh, and tends to tank uh, during the last uh, term uh, of a, a two-term president, but the changes really happen over time, and by that we mean a longer period of time than the time they're in office. The final Final judgment really does take decades, and President Truman is a great example. Uh, when he left office, he wasn't nearly as popular uh, as he is in many uh, presidential job approval ratings that we see today. Um, a lot of times the presidential approval is only indicative of a particular piece uh, that people may see in the media, so a lot of times it doesn't highlight uh, the holistic view of the presidency, but really just some good or bad decisions that were made along the way, or what people heard about in the media. Uh, and uh, a lot of times that honeymoon period lasts really, really a very short time, uh, with one of the exceptions, uh, such as 9-11 uh, during the George W. Bush administration, where uh, people really rallied around the flag and President Bush's um, approval rating really soared uh, after his um, his uh, first year in office because of the uh, because of, of such of the patriotism that was present uh, during after September 11th, uh, 2001. Uh, so these are the top 10 highlights uh, from this chapter. I hope you found this helpful. Again, go back through the slides if you need to in more detail. Go through your concept cards, uh, and I hope you will demonstrate your awesomeness on the Chapter 12 quiz and hashtag Live the Five.